Hello, and welcome to Reimagining Love. I'm Dr. Alexandra Solomon. Relationships have the power to wound us and the power to heal us. As a clinical psychologist, author, and professor at Northwestern University, I've devoted my life to studying intimate partnerships and family dynamics. On Reimagining Love, I'm here to translate complex clinical topics into tools and takeaways that you can use in your relationships today. If you're ready to develop relational self-awareness and create vibrant and loving relationships with the people who matter most to you, you've come to the right place. I'm so glad that you're here. Dr. Joy Harden Bradford is my guest on today's episode. I'm really excited for you to get to know her and hear our conversation. Dr. Joy is a licensed psychologist, a speaker, and founder and CEO of Therapy for Black Girls, and the host of its wildly popular mental health podcast. Her work focuses on making mental health topics more relevant and accessible for Black women, And she specializes in creating spaces for them to have fuller and healthier relationships with themselves and others. Dr. Joy is currently writing her first book, Sisterhood Heals, which is set to release in the summer of 2023. In this episode, Dr. Joy and I get straight into the good stuff. We talk about stigmas and accessibility issues in the mental health field and her mission to normalize and promote therapy and support, especially for Black women. Dr. Joy also specializes in helping clients heal from breakups, and I loved her wisdom and offerings on that topic. We also discussed a great listener question from a single mom who is experiencing some serious FOMO, fear of missing out. Finally, if you are considering starting therapy, Dr. Joy and I talk about green flags when you're looking for a therapist who's a good fit for you. There is so much goodness in this conversation. I hope that you love hearing from Dr. Joy. Dr. Joy, thank you so much for being here with me today. I'm so glad to have a chance to meet you. Thank you. We've been chatting on Instagram DM, so it's great to actually be chatting (laughs) video-wise. I love that. I love that transition, for sure. Thank you to Instagram. It's how we oftentimes meet wonderful people who are doing wonderful work, but it's nice to go from there to something a little more real. Agreed. I know that for all the Reimagining Love listeners who haven't yet discovered you and your work, I know there's going to be just like great synergy. So I'm excited to make this introduction to listeners who perhaps haven't discovered you yet. Okay, so on Reimagining Love, we start from a place that we are whole as we are and also these bodacious blends of growing edges. So I would love to ask you our relational self-awareness question. Are you ready for it? I'm ready. Okay. So, Dr. Joy, what is a growing edge that you are currently working on in one of your important relationships? And what has it been teaching you lately? Mm -hmm. This is a very big question, but also a lovely question. I like it. I think the growing edge that I'm working with mostly is the relationship with myself. So it just feels like in the past, you know, three plus years of the pandemic, There's just been a lot going on. I think I am being stretched in a lot of ways, but also trying to hold a lot of different things. And so I think one of the growing edges for me is really being more self-compassionate and really being gentle with myself. You know, I feel like before the pandemic, there was a lot of go, go, go. And that kind of slowed down in the past couple of years, but also not really. You know, so there's been lots of virtual presentations. I'm also writing my first book. My kids have been virtual schooling. So, you know, they did go back in person just, you know, a month ago. We just bought a new house. So so there's just a lot that's been going on. And it feels like there's been a lot of competing things for like my energy and time and focus. And so I'm really trying to do a better job of like balancing, well, maybe not balancing, but like, okay, what needs my attention right Mm -hmm. now and being okay with not being able to kind of be all things at the same time in all of those places. Right. Knowing that at the end of the day, you can either focus on what you were able to get through or you can focus on all the things you didn't get through. And there's one path that is far more compassionate than the other path. 
Right. Mm -hmm. You named all these like layers of complexity with the pandemic, but especially as, you know, as clinicians, right, it is holding and being present to our clients' challenges while we have our own challenges of homeschooling little, you know, homeschooling kids and for you writing a book and for you, I imagine also as a BIPOC clinician, just sitting, not just in the pandemic pain, but also these added layers of the racial reckoning and the inequitable fallout of the pandemic. And so I can imagine that for everything I have felt as a clinician, you know, on those emotional front lines, it is that much more for you and the work that you do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, you know, even, of course, the pandemic, like there were racial pieces to that, right? Like very early on, we found out that Black and Brown communities were hit hardest, right, in terms of the rates of um, people both contracting COVID, but also dying from COVID. And so, you know, the work that I do with Therapy for Black Girls really kind of require me to kind of have these spaces where people could kind of like process their grief, but also get a better understanding of what was happening for them. So we had that part of the pandemic, but then we also had, you know, the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, you know, so again, we're just all trying to like keep ourselves safe and keep our family safe from this virus. And then there's also these continuing acts of racism that we needed places to process. And so because of the work that I do, it definitely required me, I think, to kind of stretch and and kind of Mm -hmm. be available to my community so that we could, you know, do the gathering that we need to do to kind of process how we're feeling. As you look back, do you feel proud of what you were able to offer and create during those months? Absolutely. I mean, I feel like I have always been really proud of the work, but I definitely feel like this stage of my career, kind of just given what was going on in the world, really required me to to stretch and do some things differently um, as a clinician, you know, and I just think my career itself, just fascinates me, um, you know, because, you know, six years ago, like if you had asked, like, what would my career look like? It would not look like it does now. I still have a very small private practice, but most yeah. of my work is, you know, the podcast and doing mm-hmm. public speaking and those kinds of things. I have been very proud of the work that I've been able to do during the pandemic. And I'm just excited about, you know, being able to continue doing some of this work. I can imagine because everything, well, Your podcast is huge and it's magnificent and it's thoughtful. And I can tell how much heart and brain and soul you bring to it. Like I'm just imagining your listeners are obviously people out in the community, but also I imagine how many clinicians turn to your podcast and then as a source for themselves. And then they go into their week, right, of the 20, 25, 30 clients that they're going to serve and you have nourished them so that they can go and do what they need to do. And so it, you're still in the trenches doing clinical work, but you really have stepped into this other space where you are providing a kind of like a nourishment, right? Like sort of serving the servers in, in that way. Yeah. Like nothing grad school could have necessarily prepared me for, but, yeah, no. but the skills I think are transferable, <laughs> right? Like I think that's one of the coolest things about being a psychologist is that we do learn skills that really can transfer to lots of different ways to kind of practice or, you know, offer clinical information. Well, that's a whole separate conversation, isn't it, about the training, (laughs) right? Like how, I mean, I can imagine that all of our graduate programs are just like trying to play catch up of what we all are doing now with this work, the platforms that we're building, the ways that we're taking this field in all kinds of directions, like these, I think oftentimes about these poor graduate programs that really still do just need to do what they're doing, which is provide really, really solid clinical skills because nothing else can get built unless you are turning out clinicians with really solid skills, right? So they've got to stay in their lane, doing what they do. Thank you to all the programs that are providing excellent, excellent clinical training so that we can then be like, okay, how are we going to bust out? Where is it going to go next? Right? How do we transform? It is is really cool, I think. But you're right. I don't think the programs and like our professional boys, like I think that they're, they're trying to do a little bit of catch up to keep up with all the ways that we are growing, I think, so quickly. Yeah. You began your business, Therapy for Black Girls, back in 2014. Could you have imagined, like, tell us a bit about how it has grown over the years and when those moments have been where you've been like, oh my gosh, like, this is an entire movement. Like, what has that journey been like for you? Yeah, you know, I started in 2014, I started it as a blog. So I had watched the um, Black Girls Rock Award show on BET and like the energy even through the TV screen was just palpable. And so I thought, wow, it would be cool to capture even just a little bit of this energy related to Black women for mental health. 
And so I came up with the name, the domain was available. And so I bought it and just started blogging on the site about what kinds of questions would you ask a therapist who you were interested in working with? And how do you make the most of your support system? Really just, you know, trying to do some outreach. So my background is in um, college student mental health and outreach presentations were always my favorite things. (laughs) And so I kind of saw the blog as a way to kind of do written forms of the outreach presentations that I had already been doing. But then it just kind of took off off. And then we added the therapist directory. So I continue to see these conversations online of people saying, oh, I really love to work with a Black therapist. Does anybody have a recommendation for a great Black woman therapist? And so I thought, why why isn't there a place where these recommendations are collected? Like, can we get a list going, basically? Um, And so I started a Google Doc for people to recommend their therapist. So if you were a Black woman who had had good experience with a therapist, you shared their name in a Google Doc, and then I compiled them by state for other people to be able to reach out. Um, So that very quickly turned into something that was not manageable, like just by me anymore. (laughs) Because of course, like, you know, you built it and they came (laughs) and they came right. Was not at all expecting it. Um, And then as therapists heard about it, they wanted to add their information. And so again, it just got very unwieldy very quickly. And honestly, like I am very tech savvy, but not the degree of tech required to like power something like the directory. Mm -hmm. And so I avoided it for a while. Like I didn't really want to do it because I was very intimidated by the technology I knew was going to be needed to, to kind of get it off the ground. Um, And so it was a lot of like calling colleagues and people introducing me to people so that I could like find somebody to build this thing that would allow people to add themselves. So I finally Mm -hmm. got a first iteration of the directory, but at the same time, I also added the podcast to the mm-hmm. Therapy for Black Girls mm-hmm. business. Um, mm-hmm. So in the, the way the podcast came about is that, you know, I was doing Therapy for Black Girls, but I was also the director of the Counseling Center at Clark Atlanta University. And I had a 45 minute oh. to an hour commute each way. So I started listening to a bunch of podcasts and thought, oh, this is really cool. Like, I feel like there's some conversations we could probably have at Therapy for Black Girls that would play nicely as a podcast. And so I started it thinking like, oh, this sounds really easy. Like, it's just people talking. Of course, being on the other side, now we know. <laughs> it's a little more involved. <laughs> it's, it's far more involved. You know, people make it sound effortless, right? Like, that's, I think, the mark of a great podcast is that it sounds like it's just people chatting, but there's yeah. tons of hours of work, you know, on the other side. So the podcast is really, I think both the podcast and the directory kind of took off at the same time. So it's really kind of hard to say like Uh, which one kind of exploded first because it it feels like they kind of happen simultaneously. And no, you know, to your earlier question, I could not have imagined that Mm -hmm. it would be where it is. You know, like we, we do some promotion for the podcast and the directory, but a lot of it is word of mouth, which is incredible. I I just feel so grateful to have such an engaged community um, of people who like love the podcast or find a great therapist and they, they just want to tell the world about it. So a lot of our you know, promotion really happens because of word of mouth. So I'm very thankful and grateful for that. Ambassadors who have said, y'all should know about this therapist. She's doing good work. Yeah. yeah. You identified and stepped into a need, right? Like that's why this is all caught fire is that you named a problem, which is that black women's voices have historically been silenced and their mental health concerns have not been centered the way that other groups' mental health concerns have. Can you talk to us a little bit about why it's so crucial for black women to have spaces where they can unpack their unique experiences and challenges? Yeah, you know, I'd also talk about the fact that I feel like I had been doing therapy for Black girls before it had that name. Um, So on the college campuses that I was on, I was always running a group for the Black women students on campus. You know, you know the history of our field. You know, it was developed mostly by older white men. And so when all these theories and, you know, concepts were being developed, that was not language or we were not a part of like the development of those things. And so while there are some things that kind of are the same for our population in our community. There's a lot of things related to psychology and mental health that just look very different for Black women. And because we were not a part of like the history and the building of the field, there has been a lot of stigma related to mental health, especially in the Black community. So the idea that you would talk to a stranger about some very personal things, like that's just not something that a lot of our families have had a history Mm -hmm. of doing. And so when you're talking about 
what kinds of things do we need to do to be well? You have to approach that, I think, very differently for Black women. You kind of, you typically have to kind of go to where they are, um, which again was why outreach was always one of my favorite things because it felt like an opportunity to take what we were doing in the counseling center and bring it to the students. So let's go do these presentations in their residence halls and let's go do it at their student organization meetings. I kind of see the work that we do as Therapy for Black Girls at Therapy for Black Girls as like outreach kind of magnified, really kind of bringing psychology and mental health to people where they are. And then the numbers have not been there, right? Like it is the reason that you needed to create a directory is it is very, it has historically been very difficult to find Black clinicians, Black female clinicians, or Black clinicians of any gender. And so I imagine there's this like beautiful iterative process that you have kicked off where the more Black women, Black people can like see you, see Black clinicians, like kind of know that therapy is not sitting with a white, per, you know, an old white person, whatever, like whatever notions, whatever stereotypes there are about therapy that are perpetuated by media and mythology and whatever, it becomes this like feedback loop where the more you show, listen, this is for us. This is done by us and for us. Uh, I know that the graduate program that I have been involved with, I see so many more Black trainees coming into the program. And that's really, really encouraging because that's also how we make this right and create the shifts that need to happen right? mm-hmm. by inviting by inviting more Black women into the field, Black men into the field too, for that matter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you know, the unfortunate part is that You know, there's been so much excitement and so much need that there are tons of people who want to perhaps work with a black woman therapist and then everybody's just full. Right. You know, so the numbers still are not there. So I'm very excited to hear that more trainees are coming, you know, kind of in the pipeline because that's definitely needed. The reality is that even if every black woman wanted a black woman therapist, like there just are not enough of us to go around. So that means that, you know, maybe they have to either, you know, wait on a wait list or they you know, we'll see somebody who is not a Black woman, you know, so that means that non-Black therapists also need to be doing their work so that they can create spaces where Black women can have positive therapeutic experiences. When you are talking to Black women clients who are entertaining the idea of working with a non-Black therapist, what is it that you want that client, potential client, to know and feel in order to know that she can actually let her guard down and take the energy and take the risk to invest in a, you know, interracial therapeutic relationship. Because we know the therapy relationship is real. It is a real relationship. And you have to feel that sense that my therapist has my back. My therapist is my, in my corner. My therapist is competent. My therapist wants to understand me. Are there particular questions or felt senses that you want a, a prospective Black client to feel and know and ask for if she's going to consider working with a non-Black therapist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it is okay to be very upfront in those initial consultations about what you're looking for and to be able to ask a therapist, like, do you have other Black women on your caseload? Can you talk to me about your comfort and expertise in working with other Black women clients? Um, I also encourage people to to be open to surprises, right? So, you know, it, you may have wanted to work with a Black woman therapist, but there's also some incredible clinical work that you can do with people who don't come in the package that you expected or maybe were looking for. So I encourage people to be open to the process. But I also think that so much of that is on the therapist, right? You know, and I think, you know, our earlier conversation around like training programs, I I feel like this is where some of our training programs have not always done a great job in terms of, you know, like you can't bring a topic to the therapeutic environment before the client Mm. does, right? Like, I feel like that's a clear miss because I feel like the therapist, it's your responsibility to name, hey, we're very different in this experience. And I just want you to know that if there's something that comes up around race or whatever, you can talk about that here. Um, But a lot of therapists don't. And so I think that that sends a very clear message that that's untalkable, right? And of course, as therapists, we never want to give that message. But Mm -hmm. I think a lot of our training has really kind of led us to feel that way. So I do think that there are some things that potential clients can do, but I think the onus really is on the therapist to make sure that they are naming these issues and making yeah. the, the the client feel comfortable in that space. A hundred percent. And I suspect that there is a difference in the experience of a non-Black, but still BIPOC therapist and a white therapist, right? Because as a white therapist, I know that 
to naming race in the room goes against everything that I have taught about whiteness, right? I have been taught from an early age, it is not polite to talk mm. about race, which is part of how white supremacy, you know, keeps itself where it is. So I, that is absolutely in my work and in my training, it is incumbent upon me and the folks I'm training that that is something that you bring into the room for exactly the reason you're saying is our clients follow our lead. If I'm not explicit about you know, you can talk about sex in this space. There's no way a client's going to talk, bring up their sex life unless I model that we can talk about racial difference. We can talk about gender difference. All of the differences that exist in our relationship then become, as we like to call it, grist for the mill. But you're right, the responsibility 100 times out of 100 is on the therapist to be the relational leader in that mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, Okay, so I know that one of the things you really love to work on in your clinical work is helping people through breakups and moving into new beginnings. What is it that has drawn you to that clinical specialty of breakups? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was something that I kind of found as a pattern and probably because I was doing a lot of college student work. Right. You know, and so it feels developmental that a lot of times that's when you have your, you know, maybe first major heartbreak. And so I just kind of saw it as a theme and then thought like, oh, this is something that I could kind of just make my thing. And I also think that at least it's been my experience for women, a lot of times that there is this transformation and like new things that open up after a breakup that like you just didn't even consider, right? Like it's kind of like all of this facade and like all of these stories that you had built up really come crumbling down and then you have a new opportunity to make something different out of these pieces. And so I also think that it's it's just an incredible honor to be able to sit with someone on Mm -hmm. the side of that and really just an honor to witness like what people rebuild of their lives on the other side of like this major devastation. Yeah. As you say that, it's hard for me to think of another kind of cracking open that has that kind of opportunity, right? It is such that like both and of devastation and opportunity, like other kinds of grief, death and other kinds of loss. So there's something that is so ripe about devastation and loss and that, right, people don't Where are we ever supposed to learn how to move through a breakup well? And so it oftentimes is in a therapist's office that folks are trying to figure out how you tend to a broken heart, how you learn what what you want to learn or what's available to learn, how you know when to move move forward, how you move forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also feel like, you know, in society and like in our peer groups, like there isn't always the reverence, I think, for breakups that there is for maybe even like a divorce or other kinds of losses. So I think it kind of taps into that disenfranchised grief where, you know, people tell you like, oh, just get over it. There are plenty more people to date, you know, like that kind of thing. And I don't think that that really helps people. It it really kind of, you know, wants to rush them through this grieving process when really they need us a space to sit and kind of feel all of the emotions that come with the loss of this relationship, but also the loss of whatever story we had attached. Because a lot of times it is the story that is more devastating than it is like the loss of that person. So I think being a therapist who who gives people space to do that is really something valuable because you don't always get that in even your friendship circles. That's right. Yeah. Friendship circles very often are, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, like what we would call like the idiot compassion, right? Of like, they didn't mean anything or they were never, I didn't like them from the beginning (laughs) or, you know, let's get you drunk. Let's get you the best way to get over someone is to get under someone new. All Mm -hmm. of this that is perhaps done from a place of love and care, but, but really invalidates the grief and puts people at risk of just kind of glossing over the loss and diving into the next thing. Yeah. What do you feel like are some common mistakes that therapists might make in their work with somebody who's going through a breakup? Like, are there things that you, things you worry about therapists doing or promoting when a client has come in and they want to work on their breakup or need to work on their breakup? Mm hmm. Yeah, I think one is the pacing. Right. So I think even therapists can sometimes in some ways minimize like the devastation that happens after a breakup. I think particularly with younger clients, you know, so like college age mm-hmm. um, students, you know, because, of course, when you're a little older, you know, 
you know, just from your own history, like there will be so many other heartbreaks and, you know, but that first one, I think is is really hard um, or even one of those early ones. And so I think unintentionally therapists will sometimes try to minimize that as well, which I don't think, you know, of course, like we just talked about helps. The other thing that I see therapists often miss is the real need to disconnect from an ex on social media. So I think, you know, for therapists who maybe aren't, you know, as social media savvy or don't quite get that whole world, that's a huge piece of the treatment plan that I think can be missed because a lot of work with clients, at least, you know, probably in the past five years has been around like, okay, well, how are you still connected to this person on social media? Even if you're not talking with them anymore, are you still, you know, visiting their Facebook page and paying attention to their Instagram page and looking at their Instagram stories, right? Um, So I think if you're not somebody who is really kind of in that world, that can be something that's missed, but is really, really important in the healing after a breakup. Absolutely. I just went through this with a client where I had done some screening around like, what is the contact that she has with this ex on social media? So I, you know, obviously I know, I know to kind of check in with that, but it was so sweet. She showed up for a session and she had a little sheepish look on her face and she let me know that even though she has set her Instagram so she can't see his stuff, she is still looking at the fact that he looks at her stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and she has identified clear as a bell that, that, that triggers a whole set of ruminative thoughts. Of course, right? Of course, of course, of course. And so much the same way we do with somebody when we're kind of moving through any other kind of addictive or compulsive behavior, you know, I was just like, okay, what is the little baby leading edge that you might consider around just a tighter boundary. And it's, listen, it's objectively difficult. Like people have got their, like their Zelle account sometimes will pay, you know, you'll see things. So it is, it's hard to, in mm-hmm. every single one of those cutting of those energetic, you know, cords is another step into the grief. So I get that it's hard, but I think you're so spot on, Dr. Joy, in saying that therapists, especially therapists of a certain age or therapists who've been in a longer term relationship themselves and so they haven't gone through that kind of partnering, breaking up, really, really do need to stay, you know, stay educated on what's going on and then just um, really be in the weeds with clients about where are all the places that you might see because seeing and air quotes your ex on social media and seeing them in real life for your brain, your brain doesn't really know the difference between those two things. Right. And so it is, it's so hard to let go. It's so hard to kind of close those final tabs. It makes the grief so much more real, but when they aren't closed, it makes the healing so much more difficult. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I find that that is the hardest part of the the treatment planning, so to speak, with clients after a breakup is like that digital disconnection, yeah. you know, which is interesting because like 10 years ago, like this wasn't even a part of the work you would necessarily be doing with a client around a breakup, right? So for all the great things that I think social media has introduced, it has also introduced all these other things that I think for breakups, but also for lots of other mental health concerns, like there's this component to social media and like our digital spaces that you also really have to pay attention to. Yeah. So maybe the takeaway for someone who's listening is to really notice what happens in your body. You know, before you open up Instagram, when you see that they've read your story, how that feels when you see that, how it feels after, where do your thoughts go? Like really paying attention to that data of your body. Because our bodies communicate to us clear as a bell very often. It's just that so often we're used to overriding or saying, it's okay, I can handle it. It doesn't really bother me that much. But to get really curious about all those little shifts that happen inside of us when we open up, you know, an app and see something from an ex. Mm -hmm. Yes. The first piece you named also about a a concern of yours about therapists struggling to pace in the wake of a breakup. That makes a lot of sense to me also. And I think it is a risk, especially with younger clients that therapists are at risk of kind of minimizing either a brief relationship or a relationship that's been ambiguously defined or a relationship that when the client was young. And I know I, um, a few years ago, I sponsored a Northwestern undergraduate's honors thesis, and she pulled together three of the most progressive 
feminist sex ed curricula. And she did kind of this really cool thematic analysis looking for themes of power and pleasure. But one thing she found in her thematic analysis that we hadn't even gone looking for was how much, even in these very progressive curricula, young relationships were minimized. Like there were like terms like puppy love or it's not real love or it's just a crush. And so I think that really like was such an aha moment for me around a particular kind of cultural myth that if you're young, you don't know what love is. And if you're young, it can't really matter that much. It can't be that devastating. So I think that point you just made about therapists working with younger clients, emerging adult clients on these first breakups, like really do need to hold the sacredness of it because that cultural mythology can lead a therapist to miss it and minimize it and rush through it. Yeah. And you also just named another really important point that I think is important to pay attention to, like the ambiguous relationships. Right. So, you know, I think especially for younger people, like they are reimagining relationships in all kinds of different ways. Right. And so, you know, there are these things they call situationships and like lots of different things that are meaningful to them. But like publicly, nobody maybe even knew that these people were together, you know, but it can still be a major loss. And I think an even more detrimental loss because maybe no Nobody knew about it. Right. So it, it was like this yes. secret thing and then it ends. And so maybe the therapist is one of the only places you have to even be honest about the fact that this thing was happening. You know, so I think that that's something else that therapists want to be aware of is that there are lots of different reimagining of relationships that you do want to be mindful of that those losses can be really big for people, too. Oof, that's just so important. That's right. Because that client's relationship story doesn't fit in some sort of neat narrative box that lives inside the therapist's brain, it challenges the therapist to really decenter the therapist's own notions and beliefs about what relationships are called, the sequencing of commitment, and really just get so curious about what did this person mean to you? Who did you get to be when you spent time with this person? What parts of you were you not allowed to express because you had to be playing it cool because it was just a situationship? And could you, for the very first time, perhaps in this conversation with me and therapy with me, let yourself feel how freaking much you liked them, how freaking excited you were about the possibility that it might move from a situationship to something more, right? But if all of that stuff is buried, the client is very much at risk of getting stuck and having that like incomplete, invalidated grief. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was so beautiful how you just worded that. That feels like an invitation just to say more, right? Like I think mm-hmm. that the wording we use is just so important. The wording we use is so important. Does it open it up or does it shut it down? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's a big question, but let me just let me just try it because I I know that you've got a good answer to this. Mm-hmm. What do you want people to know about how do you know when a therapist is a good match for you? Like what do you you know, what do you like people to be like listening for, feeling for when they know it's a, a therapist is a good fit for them? Mm-hmm. So one of the first things that comes to mind is this feeling of like, oh, I can't wait to talk with her about this. Right. <gasps> so this even uh-huh. when you know it's going to be difficult, like you're already keeping a, a mental tally of I can't wait to go to therapy to talk with them about this because I know that they're going to be able to help me in some way or I can I feel safe to share that there. Um, I think that that is a huge sign that you feel safe and comfortable in that space. So I think that that is one of the feelings to kind of be mindful of and pay attention to. I think early on in the process, You may not quite feel comfortable like saying like a big secret, you know, or the thing that brings you in that you don't even want to acknowledge to yourself. So you may not feel comfortable saying it immediately, but could you see yourself eventually sharing it with this person, right? Mm -hmm. Like, are you already feeling like, okay, we can have some, you know, good conversations here. I feel seen by them. I feel like they get me. I don't feel like they're questioning whether this thing I shared actually happened. And so when I get ready, when I feel more comfortable, I feel like I will be able to say this thing here. So I think that that's something Mm -hmm. else to be paying attention to. But Mm -hmm. I also think it's really important to pay attention to feelings very early on of "Mm, this just doesn't, this doesn't feel right. And I think especially for Black clients, because there tends to be this like weird dynamic around authority and, you know, like this person is here to help me. And so I kind of got to, just power through it. 
we can sometimes like dismiss our own like intuition and like our own thoughts and feelings about how we perceive an experience. So if early on you're getting some signs of like, I just don't feel like this is right. I think it's okay to one, have that conversation. If you can name with your therapist, like what doesn't feel right. But also if you feel like, you know what, I I don't see myself even getting to a place where I'm going to be able to share that it's okay to kind of terminate that relationship and look for a therapist who you feel like is going to be a better fit. And I think a lot of people get very weird and very anxious about like breaking up with a therapist. But we as therapists, we know that that's a part of the process, right? So you're not necessarily (laughs) hurting our feelings. We want you to be well and, you know, to be able to do good work, even if that's not with us. And so it is a real, I think, one, that's a huge assertiveness step um, that I think a lot of people struggle with. So it's just good practice to be able to kind of name your needs. But it also is a great way, I think, to really practice listening to your intuition and doing something that feels like this is something that is more in line with who I feel like I need as a therapist. Ah, beautiful. Number one, are you looking forward to talking about it? It's like, oh boy, okay, I know, I know that we're going to have a really rich conversation about this. So that like that positive anticipation. Number two, even if I haven't shared with you my really challenging secret, I can start, I'm getting closer and closer to imagining that I could share that. And then three, if I've got a twisty feeling in my gut, or I have felt missed or misunderstood by you, I love the idea of a client giving a therapist a chance, you know, and raising it and naming it. Like you said, it might be a, you know, I think especially for a black client, it's such a risk because if a black client takes the risk, especially if the therapist is a white therapist and the therap- and the white therapist dismisses it, it feels not like another microaggression on top of a big old stack of other microaggressions or painful misses. But I do love the idea of, I mean, every client is authorized to bring any piece of feedback to their therapist. It is essential. It is vital because it's a real relationship and it can be that practice ground. And any therapist worth their fee knows how to metabolize feedback and not get punitive and not get whatever, sassy or dismissive. I know, especially when I'm working with when I'm working with black clients, that is vital. Like when a black client of mine will take the risk to say, I felt misunderstood by you in this moment. I am so grateful for the chance to see if we can initiate a repair. That is huge, you know, because therapists are people and they're not perfect. And there are a lot of therapists who aren't good therapists or aren't good therapists for you. Then, right. Can you, can you break up and, and go? But that's Mm -hmm. a a really helpful framework, Dr. Joy. Really helpful. Thank you. Okay. Well, let's see what we can do for Lauren. So we have a listener question from Lauren who writes in from Texas. She uses she, her pronouns. And what she wrote to us is, how do you deal with FOMO, the fear of missing out? It's something I've struggled with for years in my friendships and currently in my intimate relationship. I've been a single mom since I was 18. So for the last 11 years, most of my friends and my current partner don't have kids. So at times, it's really hard for me to sit and watch them go out and do things I can't afford and or don't have the time for. I really want to be happy and excited when my friends and partner talk about the upcoming vacations they're taking or going to fun events. But instead, I'm usually left feeling resentful and lonely. My partner and I have been trying to work through these feelings, but we don't know how. Any advice or tools would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Joy, what what stands out to you about this question? Mm-hmm. So thank you for that question, Lauren. That, that is an important question. I think you probably, you are, well, I know you're not alone in feeling that way. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people, the fact that we even have a term called FOMO lets us know that lots of people feel this way. So I think it's brave of you to name that for yourself. Like, I, I feel really insecure about this. I feel left out. So a couple of things that stood out to me was being a single mom since 18. So I would imagine that that was not the vision that you had for like how a pregnancy and parenting would go. And and my feeling is that, or what I would want to know more about is like what kind of story you've created around being a single parent since 18, you know? So I'm sure that you had to make very different choices than maybe you planned, right? So did college still happen? Did it happen on a different time frame? Were your parents supportive? Like I would want to know all of that mm-hmm. um, because it, it, it kind of feels like there's an undercurrent of I missed out on a lot 
because I was parenting by myself at 18, right? At 18, yeah. when we are all, well, a lot of us are still trying to figure out like who we are. Now you have been responsible for someone else. And so I would want to know more about like what story you've created about who you were as a mom and being a mom at that time in your life. Um, so that's one. I would also encourage you to perhaps have this conversation with your friends and your partner. Like, are there ways that the friendship can be more expansive to include things that you also mm. can participate in, given your time and your budget? You know, so yeah. it may be that they are just not aware or, you know, what often happens is that you say no so much that friends stop inviting you. I hope that's not happening. But if it is, like, can you, you know, get more creative around what kinds of things we can do that still allow us to have a lot of fun? You know, can we go have a picnic in a park somewhere? Can we go on a on a hike somewhere? Can somebody do more in terms of babysitting for you? Well, maybe not babysitting because the, the baby's probably not such a baby yeah, anymore. Yeah, she's 11. But she, needs, she needs supervision. Oh, 11, but still needs yeah. supervision, yeah. right? Yeah, so I mean, so is there a friend who could, you know, be with your child for a weekend while you go and do something mm. or just even not go do something, just be alone with your thoughts, right? Sometimes <laughs> that is hard from moms to get, you know, so I, I would encourage you to have this conversation with your friends to see and to be honest, not in a shaming kind of like you did this to me, but here's how I'm feeling. I, I just honestly want you all to know I, I often feel left out. And I wonder if there are ways that we could think about doing more so that I feel more included in activities as well. Yeah. I'm trying to hold on to these two tracks. One track is her FOMO makes a ton of sense. Like it is objective reality. She does not have the kind of agility that she's watching her friends and her partner have. And I was wondering, much in line with what you're saying, if the FOMO is pointing her towards some unresolved grief work that she may, you know, like, I don't know what happened. Like you were you know, you were wondering about kind of how was this plan? Was this a vision? Who supported you? And as it was happening, were you able, was she able to grieve? Was she able to really work to, I don't know what the emotions, like, was she able to move some anger through, some shame through, like to create, like what was her emotional processing in getting ready to become a mom at 18? I know there was, I imagine there was a lot of logistics that had to get figured out. But um, it's also, it's a lot to ask an 18-year-old to do that kind of emotional processing. But it means that she now at, you know, in her late 20s has the chance to almost like reparent the 18-year-old self of hers, right? So I would love for her to be able to do some really gentle work around, you know, I don't know if she needs to forgive her 18-year-old self, love on her 18-year-old self, celebrate what that 18-year-old self was able to do despite it all. But I have wondered if some of that FOMO, that craving, resentful, may just in part, part, it's reality based. Is it also in part showing her some reckoning she needs, she needs and deserves to do with herself mm -hmm. so that she can then feel really proud of whatever she's been able to accomplish within these constraints over these last 11 years? Great questions. I really love that you pointed us to community care, right? I wonder if she had been, if she had imagined that there would be more care from her parents or from her partner, and she maybe has felt deeply disappointed and let down by what wasn't there. But I wonder now, 11 years in, who is in her corner? Who might she be able to? Is there a community of other single moms that she could create you know, a rotating schedule of kind of like, I mean, that's, that's be fun for kids. I can imagine to have a chance to be with other loving families and let her, as you said, kind of tag out for a bit or have some enough of a version of these kinds of experiences that she feels just a little more satisfied, a little more content that her life has different elements to it. Mm hmm. You know, I mean, the amazing thing about this is she's going to be probably less than 40 when this little child of hers is off in the world. So I'm also hopeful for like what the sort of quote unquote normal thing, the thing that we have sort of said is the normal right way of doing life is that you're free and easy and exploring the world in your 20s. Well, maybe she's free and easy and exploring the world in her 40s and 50s. I tell you what, that might be, I mean, I, I feel very hopeful for her next chapters and her reimagining of what her life gets to look like and that her child will then get to see her 
reimagining and celebrating and growing herself in these ways because her child has grown and, you know, she's going to be young and vibrant for a long, long time, God willing, and Mm -hmm. able to create more for herself going forward. Yeah, I think that that's a beautiful point, right? Like this, when you're in your 40s and 50s, sometimes you have more resources and more, you know, just kind of wherewithal to kind of be able to make, uh, to really appreciate like that freedom than you did in your like early teens or late teens and early 20s, right? Like you typically don't have a lot of money then, yeah. you know, your your entire brain is not even fully developed at that point, right? And so what could this look like? And, and can you look forward to what it looks like once, you know, your child is of age and maybe out of the home? Like what? could that look like? What new phase might you be able to walk into in your life? Yeah. I think the grief work and the compassion work and the kind of making sense of that chapter of becoming a young single mom, like doing that, like turning backwards to do that work maybe is then what frees her up to start to get excited about what's for, because she's stuck, right? I mean, she's telling us she's stuck. I'm Mm -hmm. stuck. I'm in a cycle of resentment and FOMO. Okay. Well, that's, that's because something is pulling you back. And if and as she's able to tend to that really gently, I imagine it will kind of loosen her up or create some spaciousness inside of herself to imagine what what might be coming next. Mm -hmm. Mm, Lauren, I love this question. I think that even if folks don't have this exact version of it, that feeling of FOMO is so real. I think it's amplified by social media. It's something that invites us to attend to, okay, so what, what's the work inside of me? Mm -hmm. Dr. Joy, I have loved talking with you. This has been really so great. Likewise, likewise. Beautiful conversation. Thank you so much for having and having such great conversation, great questions. All right. Well, I imagine that plenty of people are like, oh, good. She finally has Dr. Joy on. But for people who are just discovering you and your work today in this conversation, where is the next step? Where do you want people to go in terms of learning more about you and what you're up to? Mm -hmm. So you can follow me across social media at Hello Dr. Joy. I am on all of the platforms at that same username. And then my website is HelloDrJoy.com. Um, so you can follow me there and, you know, get updates about information. And then you can visit my book website at sisterhoodheals.com to get information about when the book will be released and lots of fun, you know, conversations along the way. Um, so those are the, the main places where people can connect with me and stay updated with the work. It's just, I'm so excited for you. Like the experience of launching a book into the world is unlike, I mean, you've done a lot in your career so far, but like, I just love that you're about to have this experience of what it means to launch a book into the world. It's the most magnificent. So I'm so excited for you and we will continue. I mean, I will continue to shout, you know, shout out the book and celebrate the book as it's, as it's born. So it comes, yeah, summer of 2023 is when it's, when it's arriving in our hands. Hey. Indeed, indeed. Well, I will put all those links in the show notes. And thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Joy, for joining me today. And thank you, Lauren from Texas, for your thoughtful question. I loved discussing Dr. Joy's initiatives to help Black women connect with therapists that are right for them. I loved hearing her helpful insights about dating and breakups and so much more. You can check out Dr. Joy's website and her incredible podcast and also her Instagram by following the links in the show notes. Until next time, be well. Do you have a relationship question that you want to have answered on the show? Follow the link in the show notes of this episode to send in a written or audio question. Questions can be about intimate partnerships, family relationships, friendships, you name it. I can't wait to hear from you.